Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome to Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, Team Embassy School. These are all facets of the mission here to totally equip all missionaries. You know, missionaries need equipped before they go in a lot of ways. Uh, we saw, I, over the years, I dealt with a lot of missionaries who kind of had meltdowns on the mission field. It'd be better to deal with that stuff before you go on the mission field, but sometimes you don't know that you got it until you're in an environment that pushes your buttons. <laughs> but uh, I'm changing the title from learning to discern. We can make that a subtitle, learning to discern, to the discernment challenge. All right, we need challenge, I think. The discernment challenge. We're going to cover... Uh, about uh, eight areas. One would be definitions of discernment. What is false discernment? How to eliminate false discernment. We'll cover these one at a time. The mind, will, and emotions as it relates to discernment. How to develop discernment. How to add to the substance more and more substance. And in conclusion, it's all a matter of the heart, so we're going to have a heart check at the end. You're going to have, you need your heart checked up. The heart of the matter are usually matters of the heart. So get ready. All right. All right. I want to start with the first part of just definitions of discernment because... Um, with definitions and proper definitions, uh, you have, stand a better chance of experiencing discernment as opposed to judging. It's just, it's just real easy. Uh, I've been in ministry too many years to hear when people say, well, I discern such and such, and I, just, I get grieved in my spirit because I know it's not discernment, it's an opinion. It can be even an accurate opinion, but there's no anointing on it, there's no redemption. Okay, so the definition of discerning of spirits is the ability to discern, discern the spirit world, especially to detect the true source of circumstances and motives of people. Oh, some people don't like that. You may, you gonna read my motive? Mm-hmm. And believe it or not, motives are discernible. Um, Jennifer always said that she felt like sometimes people didn't understand source. The source means what's behind the words, where is it coming from, who's the initiator, who's the author, what kind of nature is attached to it. The best example I could see is I always saw that little, on Facebook, I'd always see that repetitive thing every now and then uh, over the years of, about a shepherd calling his sheep. And he'd call the sheep and all their heads would pick up. Someone said the exact same words, but was not the shepherd. <laughs> they just kept crazy, like, I don't know who the heck that is, but ain't nobody I know. <laughs> and his sheep hear his voice, and his sheep know his voice. You need that kind of no-so, not intellectual no-so. This is knowing in the knower. And uh, it's real important. Uh, I always found it interesting that, that Jason had the same gifting uh, I met with a half a dozen pastors every week for probably, oh, probably 20 years anyway, uh, before I even came down to this area. And uh, discernment as a gift is not that common to be all pervasive. It's usually a specialty. You know, like the principalities and powers, or they'll, under, they'll understand the human spirit, or they'll understand how to follow flow in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Some people are better at that than others. There's interpretation. There's a lot of different uh, 
avenues. But the point is, everyone has a capacity to discern. You're told to discern. But discernment comes out of the fruit of love. If it's not coming from the fruit of love, it's probably not going to be something that's really going to honor God. Even if you're right factually. You know, you could be right. You could be so right you're wrong. <laughs> but um, this discernment that I learned as a baby Christian was came out of a moment-by-moment -moment relationship. And it was in that last song that we did in worship that really impressed me. It says, um, uh, they felt the, the uh, uncomfortableness of being drawn away from him. I can remember as a baby Christian knowing, I got to go to work now. I had my private time. But there was like a, a pulling away that was not pleasant until God said, you know, there's special time and all the time. You're not leaving me. I needed to hear that because I felt like I didn't want to just go charge my battery and then live in the flesh the rest of the day, hoping that my battery lasted. But instead, it was, it was there is a special time of prayer, of union and communion, where you feed and you drink. And then you allow that to be expressed during the day in a moment-by-moment -moment relationship or practicing the presence of God. Um, the... I got, uh, in the early years, more understanding uh, of how to explain it because it was subjective. It was difficult to explain, and people looked like deer in headlights. But when I met with my pastor's friends, they, they basically said, yes, it's discerning of spirits. Now, as we know, that we could see it. Of course, then they tried to use me to, what do you discern on now? What do you discern on this, Dennis? Hey, what do you discern? Okay, all right. That's the, <laughs> the purpose is to know what spirit it is, and the source, uh, the initiator, uh, the power behind a circumstance or words or even the motive of a person. And uh, I'd love, love to do activations on this because you'd be surprised. You all have the capacity to discern. You just may not have developed it. Uh, and it was funny, but your spirit will pick up when someone's pushy did you ever feel like someone, like almost like you'd want to walk backwards when they're talking to you? That's a spiritual perception more than a mental perception. What you're experiencing there is a push of the will. The spirit, your spirit is recognizing it's being pushed. Pushed or pulled, whatever. And um, the one thing you learn about control and pushy people or controlling people is if you're under control, nobody can control someone that's under control. Isn't that marvelous? Under control means not self-control in the, in the context of self, but spirit control. Soul taming is something that we need to be trained in. Soul taming. Mind, will, and emotions do not get thrown out. They simply need to be under control. The, the yoke of the love of God, all right? All right, so more on de uh, definitions, because there's, there's different people have different uh, ways of explaining it, and uh, I lived in it before I could explain it. I had people tell me, uh, by knowing the source or what was behind, I've had people smile at me and say pleasant things, like, Dennis, you need to be in, the, in that classroom over there. Now, doesn't that sound sweet? And I would feel anger coming from them. So what I'm discerning is the source, not the actual content. The content, actually, body language-wise, was quite pleasant. The words were soft. They weren't she wasn't yelling, but there was anger in the heart. They had a little control issue, and she was trying to superficially control her control. <laughs> and I'd say, well, you don't have to be angry. That was in the first two years I was a Christian. And people were sending me people to help them, but mainly because all I found out was it, they were biblically literate. They knew the right answers, but the source behind their right answers wasn't right. Does that make sense? What's another word besides source? Jennifer says source. People don't always get what you're saying. The origination, the uh, motive, 
the nature, that's probably even better yet, the nature behind something. And we're to be partakers of the divine nature. And that, that might be a good word for some people instead of source. If, I don't know why that's confusing. That seemed pretty straightforward to me. The source of a river, you look where, where does it begin? What's behind it all? Um, but anyway, uh, the grace, uh, a lot of uh, people that are gifted a certain way have a tendency to define it according to their gifting. So I know one person is a seer. Uh, he defines it as it's the grace to see into the unseen. See, see, see. It's the grace to see into the unseen realm. The purpose is to, to know and see the nature, which for me is a, almost a contradiction, um, to see the nature which is veiled. Nature is a feeling. The nature is the substance. Substance that can be spiritually substantiated. <laughs> so, but yes, uh, in discernment, there is both seeing, hearing, and touching. But I feel that touching is the, by far the most important to discern an atmosphere, to discern, uh, because if you touch the divine nature, you do like that little illustration we talked about with the sheep. It wasn't the words. It was the nature of the shepherd was missing. Oh, if we could teach the church to recognize proper answers, even proper insights that lack the nature of God attached to them. So discernment, this is the discernment challenge. This is going to challenge really your motive. Because God... Really, I believe in this day and age with all the goofy stuff that's going on, some stuff is so obvious it's unbelievable. But then that can make you a candidate for being deceived. So don't just look at the obvious. Discerning of spirits is a spiritual gift, and it's not to be confused with natural intuition. Um, We know in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, to one's given the word of wisdom, the spirit, another the word of knowledge. Now, um, a lot of my definitions, they've come from various leaders in the body, but I still think it's interesting how you can see they emphasize the seeing, the hearing, or the touching based on their own, their own gifting. And they admit that there's strengths in different areas when it comes to discernment. But uh, to define, discern, is to separate to distinguish, to differentiate um, between the source of something. The word discern means to perceive, distinguish, differentiate between the various spiritual realms, divine, human, you have a human spirit. Unsaved people have a human spirit, evil spirit, holy spirit, human spirit, and demonic spirit. Discern means to differentiate between them. And what source? Even the identity of the personality of it. It's interesting that I believe like a, a deaf and dumb spirit, well, the name actually matches its nature. In the evil realm. But primarily, um, it's the whether it's the Holy Spirit, an evil spirit, or the human spirit, God wants to use that for the average believer to identify the condition of the spirit. It gives revelation of root issues. It gives clarity, removes confusion, and gives clear direction for deliverance, instruction, counsel, and healing. And one year old in the Lord, I had seasoned people sending me people and the only reason I was getting results was discerning the human spirit is as easy as breathing for me. And uh, Dick Iverson in his Bible school college, uh, I know his was the same as mine because I could tell by the way he defined it. Uh, discerning of spirits, he said, is our flashes of insight, just like all the gifts of the spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, word of knowledge. Nobody walks in a constant word of knowledge. Nobody walks in, okay. They're flashes of insight. But he said, some people, it operates as almost a constant. 
I agree with that because I did it. Now there are flashes of insight in discernment that is clearly flashes of insight, but there is a walk in the Spirit that constitutes an awareness of the Spirit moment by moment. And for me, I needed both of them. And both of them is still what I cherish. But here's what happened. People were coming with complicated situations, a lot of psychology, uh, but when they would come to sit down and they would say, well, I, I already forgave. Down here it felt like, I, I already forgave my mother. I already forgave. I, I don't have any other issues like that. I don't have it. And I'm sitting there thinking, gee, maybe we could go a little deeper. How do you tell somebody? <laughs> I, I had to find ways to navigate that you're clueless, but I'm trying to be polite because I learned before that, that the way I was doing it was wrong. Like that teacher said, Dennis, you need to be in that class. I said, you don't have to be angry. And, and of course, then they manifest. They go, I'm not angry. <laughs> so don't push people's buttons like that. That's not, that's not redemptive. <laughs> a person who is very controlling, I did that too, and it's a no-no. I shouldn't be teaching that stuff. Huh? Jennifer's going to get upset with me. But... But a person who's hiding their control and talking real sweet, all you have to do is say, I think you're out of control. I am not out of control. <laughs> I was cleverly disguising it as soft compact. Don't do that one. Okay. That is not redemptive. But I had to learn these things because I could feel, <laughs> I could feel the insincerity of it. And I looked at Jesus and I said, I want to do it the way Jesus would do it. And what he, he saw that his disciples were clueless before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But he saw, and he saw the dirt, but he saw through the dirt to pull the gold out. That's discerning of spirits. If you don't have a redemptive solution, I'm not really interested. It's just an opinion or a judgment. Because the least case scenario is what you discern requires... Discernment comes from the love of God. It requires releasing loving intercession at the least. And you tuck it away from maybe you will be part of the solution and maybe, maybe you just praying for them is part of the solution. You don't know until you get more information. But you do have a, a love response that is mandatory. Now, to separate, to discriminate, to distinguish the source of something. Um, <clears throat> It enables a person to identify the condition of the spirit. It gives revelation for root issues, clarity, removes confusion, and gives clarity for direction. Uh, sometimes the best direction I can discern is someone's, uh, oh, I just think, uh, I feel led. And, and if I feel frustration while they feel led, I've, I've written that off. No, you, you haven't brought the five senses, mind, will, and emotion, you, you haven't gotten those three aspects under the authority of God. I feel anxio anxiety, anxiousness. That's the wrong kingdom. That's coming from fear. Now, the gift of discerning of spirits is, is, is primarily used, uh, and the good news about it is you don't have to have my gifting in particular, but you do need to grow in your own personal discernment. You need to go what's going on inside of you. You can't be so intellectual, you are clueless to what's going on in you. You know, for years, um, uh, baby boomers were taught in church to ignore emotions because that was bad. Now, nowadays, uh, Gen Z could care less. They're all over the place. The, but you can, I, can reel, I can reel in a Gen Z and say, here, let's, let's sanctify that and bring it to Jesus. As opposed to the baby boomers going, I don't have any feeling. I haven't had a feeling since 1927. I ain't, I ain't got, not, not going to start now. Not going to start now. Don't, don't mess with the feminine side of me. I've had, yeah, this is stuff they say. Don't mess with the feminine side of me. But anyway, all I know is I had to learn that I saw redemptive help in people's lives when, we could, when they could make a distinction between physical feeling, bodily, physically feeling, emotional feeling, 
and spiritual feeling. And spiritual feeling is the presence of God. Spiritual feeling is the nature. That's what was missing on that shepherd's voice who tried to imitate the shepherd. So, this gift of discerning of spirits, <clears throat> uh, my favorite uh, definition, of course, is, uh, is the guy on the West Coast <laughs> because he had this, he, to even put it in his Bible school curriculum that all the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 come as flashes of insight, except for discerning of spirits can, for some people, be almost a constant. That only told me that's what he's operated in it, and Watchman Nee operated in it as well. Watchman Nee says, a broken man, and he meant broken like the outer shell of your flesh, a broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. I knew exactly what he was talking about, so I, I read his stuff because... I identify, none of my friends talk like that. None of my pastor friends talk like that. So you gravitate toward the ones to learn from. Brother Lawrence, practicing the presence of God, was a constant walk in the spirit. I don't know, he may have had flashes of discernment, but he had, he had a walk in the spirit down to where he could discern the nature of God moment by moment. And that's available to everybody. You don't have to... My discerning of spirits only got me to take the average Christian who was biblically literate and teach them how to function from the heart, the Bible heart, instead of the head. And learn what to do with toxic emotions that are coming between you and God. It's coming between that nature. I don't want anything to come just like the song we did this morning. I don't want anything to come between what my attachment to God. There's nothing that important. And that's really what God wants to do. So some individuals, uh, when it comes to discerning, they have uh, particular, this would be mine, this would also be Jason's. Same individuals function primarily in the realm of discerning the human spirit and deal with the, new, the needs and the root issues in the lives of believers. Does that sound like us? Yeah. Dealing with the root issues in people's lives, the human spirit. What I feel or perceive is when someone's talking, I perceive the source of coming from the human spirit. Regardless of the intellect, regardless of the choice of words, regardless of body language, the human spirit. Some others, like intercessors, might deal much of the time with the evil realm uh, in order to know how to more effectively pray destroy situations in the atmosphere. And some, I think like worship leaders know this, and uh, others may operate mostly in the realm of flow. I talked with Jim Gall once, and we were talking about this sermon. His was clearly understanding flow. So most of everything in the context of the sermon was Flow, how things move. When you interrupt the flow, when something interrupts. How many of you have ever sat in a meeting where five people shared and one person was like off the wall? <laughs> a person who's a real student of flow, and even ones that are not student of flow, knows that something was out of time. And we're going to get into that. There's soul timing and there's spirit timing. Flow would require knowing spirit timing, not soul timing. Now, those three realms. So uh, you're going to hear a lot of definitions over and over again because I use everybody's definition because it all depends on where, what their strength was. But discernment is discernment is discernment. It's the nature of God. It's the source. The source. If you don't like the word source, the initiator. The nature. <clears throat> No, the spiritual discernment is a grace to see. This is Francis uh, Frangipane. Uh, spiritual discernment is the grace to see into the unseen. Its purpose is to see into the nature of that which is veiled. Okay, see, see. Obviously, on Tuesday nights, what we do, uh, no, six to seven, we're doing ministry and troubleshooting. But from seven to eight, we are creating an environment 
to train your senses, to have your senses exercised, to discern the three realms, to discern actually what you see, what you feel, and what you hear. Isn't that, shouldn't that be part and parcel for a believer? See, hear, feel. The nature, make sure the nature's on it. Well, this is where you sit still, and then the body gets a chance to express what they see, what they hear, or what they feel. And it's very important because that's having your senses exercised to discern. You have to practice. Practicing the presence of God means you practice it. <laughs> All right? So now, this spiritual discernment is a spiritual gift, and it's not natural intuition. We said that before, and I want to say it again. Um, but when you hear about unsaved cops and firemen who go with gut feelings, these are unsaved people, but it's coming from their spirit. They call it, I got a gut feeling, I don't know, my, head, my training says do this, but I'm going with my gut. The gut knows stuff that your head don't know. And sometimes it pays to listen to it. And sometimes you need to say, what is the source that's in my gut? I would rather do that for the believer. Make sure that I know it's not fear, anger, hurt, lust, guilt, shame. That's the wrong source. That's toxic. Now, everyone needs to discern I think God just, uh, God blessed me with Jennifer many years later. Uh, they used to tease me about when I'd get with other pastors about discernment. But then after they got tired of picking on me, I remember uh, Joseph Garlington's associate. Uh, he said, okay, Dennis, I'll be honest with you. We're going to quit picking on you. He said, it's the purest discernment we've come across. And that, that wasn't to just compliment Dennis, but it was to give me an assurance that they knew what it was and that they understood the importance of it. But that gifting only helped me take people to the source and remove sources that were wrong. And in any of our books, you check all, all, of, all of the information is how to get it starting with the nature of God and removing the toxic, particularly in the emotional realm. How can you feel divine nature if your feelings are all messed up? You're only going to feel your messed up feelings. You're going to try to ignore them. You're going to try to re redirect them. I I've seen every theory out there redirecting them. Well, when you're when you're rejected, you just need to focus that pain on something else. What? No, Jesus takes your pain, your sorrow. Take it to Jesus, get rid of it. Take personal responsibility for it. Oh, just forgive and live with the pain. What a, what a miserable way of living. Everyone needs to exercise the sermon. So what God showed me that was important was that with the compliment that you've got great discernment, Dennis, with that compliment, I found out everybody doesn't need it. What God taught me in that process was everybody needs to discern themselves, and there's no excuse. No excuse. You don't need special gifting to know what's going on in your heart. All you have to do is inquire of God, and he'll gladly show you. And I went... Oh, that's a relief because I feel like I'm explaining something that nobody's catching on. But they don't have to catch on. God used it for me to just reorientate where the starting place is. If they don't start in the right place, they can have all the right answers, but they're starting wrong. They're starting from the head. That's the wrong organ. <laughs> You've got to operate from your spirit. Remember we said that. I can't see anything with my ears. Well, it doesn't mean there's nothing there. It just means you're using the wrong organ. <laughs> you're supposed to be using your spirit and not your head. Your spirit will inform your head. So, anyway. You ready? Now, this is the, this is the discernment challenge. You've got enough definitions here, I think. The one I like is, is uh, Dick Iverson's. For some, it is almost a constant. 
that's the way Brother Lawrence was, that's the way it was for me, that's the way it was for Watchman Nee. Uh, other people didn't talk like that. <laughs> but what is false discernment? I think that'd be a good way to start, right? We gave plenty of definitions of what it is. How about what it's not? It's very important to distinguish between discernment and human judgment. Our discernment is often little more than judging others. We throw the word around because it's a spiritual word. True discernment will not come until we crucify our instinct to judge people and circumstances. We must make ourselves blind to what outwardly seems apparent. Don't judge after the flesh. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. You have the capacity to look at the heart. In other words, you can see the junk, but just like Jesus did with the disciples, he saw, he saw the shortcomings, he saw what they needed, but he also saw the gold, the potential, to pull the gold out. You should be gold diggers. That's the way you use discernment. And before you pass around what you heard about somebody, did you pray for them? Because real discernment, see, now when I use that word judgment, it gets confusing sometimes because judgment is a, just make a blanket statement. We do assess situations and make judgments on a regular basis during the day. But if you're walking in the presence of God, you're letting the peace of God rule you can make assessments without writing something off, and God can then very lovingly quicken to you if you're part of the problem or part of the solution, what to do about it. But we must make ourselves blind to what, a, what seems so obvious and so apparent. Do not judge after the flesh. You know, I, I enjoyed my first pastor. The thing I enjoyed the most is I had at least three or four people over a period of a, a year or two that were kicked out of other churches <laughs> for misbehaving. So I'd meet with them once to see if they were serious about restoration. The funny thing is, in every case, they became leadership. What it is, is there was gold in there. A lot of times they made their own misunderstanding by their behavior, opinions, but ultimately, if they wanted to be part of something bigger than themselves, it all got worked out, and then the gold can be pulled out. Jesus pulled the gold out of those disciples. Even, even after he said, how long will I be with you people? How, what does the message say? How long must I be among you stupid? Are you going to stop? How did that go? I don't remember, but the message used the word stupid. It's like, do you ever feel like that? Friends, family, husband, wife, kids. <laughs> well, did you pray for them? Did you release forgiveness? All right. So false discernment. Uh, we'll never see clearly if we judge according to the flesh. You'll never discern. You'll call it discernment, but it's not. False discernment. If you want to say something important to someone, you'll first try to get their undivided attention. So if God would love to give us his undivided attention, but we would have to choose to want his undivided attention. We'd want him included in the discussion. If we're going to hear God clearly, we've got to slow down and give him our attention. Slow down. Only then will we hear and see clearly what's happening in the spiritual realm. Be still and know that I'm God. No. Eliminating false discernment when we talk about spiritual warfare, discerning of spirits, it's one of the tools that's available to us. But you have to learn to quit striving in the flesh. Worn out people, get, I, I remember the, in, uh, they called me over, I wasn't even pastoring then, I must have been about a year old now, but they called me over, they said, we don't know what to do with this guy. There's a guy standing like this, <laughs> They didn't let me give my prophetic word. They didn't, the church is going to fall apart without me giving my prophetic word. I don't know why. How come they're not letting me give my prophetic word? And I, I looked around. And I went, you know, almost everybody was gone already. And he was still demanding, you know. 
I said, the, first of all, the wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure and peaceable. I don't see anything peaceable about your, your nature right now. Do you? You're just plain upset that you didn't do it your way or that someone didn't make, give you a platform to do it your way. And, it, and it's striving to be and to do instead of allowing God to be and to do, which is by grace, the empowerment, the source, the initiator. So here's, here's the key that when God was teaching me on my own discernment, he said, just stick with this one verse in particular until you own it, Dennis. <laughs> Philippians 1.9. And this I pray that your love may abound, that means overflow, that your love would abound more and more in real knowledge and discernment. Not head knowledge, real knowledge, reality, touching the divine nature. Let your love overflow in reality and true discernment, all discernment. If you're going to have clear discernment, you need to abound in love for God and man. I don't think that's demanding too much. Isn't that something we're supposed to do? Love God and man. Your discernment when you're not loving God and loving one another, uh, even if it's accurate, it's wrong. You know, you can be accurate, you can be right and still be wrong in your heart. So the key is to effectively gauge is to encounter God and then discern the enemy, then discern how to handle the, the redemptive process. Uh, all true discernment comes through a heart that has ceased striving, a heart known even in the fiery trial of personal struggle that the Lord is God. He's supreme in the midst of it. Uh, uh, I know Jason's testified of this, I've had it, to where in the midst of sickness and pain, I've had some of the best uh, relationships with God, the best insights, and I was in the midst of pain. It wasn't like everything was smooth. It was in the midst of physical pain, but cutting through the physical pain to touch the presence is a possible for everyone and anyone, for whosoever will. That's the key, whosoever will. You give power to what you give attention to. You can focus on that, at the expense of everything else. But this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge. That's intimate knowledge and all discernment. That's total spirit, spirit, spirit. There's nothing about the head in there. It's all spirit, spirit, spirit. It'll inform the head. True discernment is always rooted in a deep love for God and people and it frees us to discern accurately. False discernment looks at people and situations outwardly and pretends to know what's going on. That should convict some people. You're pretending to know what's going on. Eh, you saw a certain behavior and you just came to a conclusion and you formed an opinion. You think you know what's going on. That's not discernment. You're judging according to appearance. We are to judge, but when we judge, judge righteous judgment. There's a difference. You're connected with God. And you're in agreement with God. You're not trying to make other people agree with you. So the key in understanding false discernment, if you can't pray for them with a heart of love, your perception will corrupt and be a little, little bit more than natural judgment. So, false discernment is often driven by an underlying force that pressures us to make judgments about a person or situation. If there's pressure to make the judgment about the person, it's almost without thinking that we immediately size up a person or make a judgment. Is there a place for intuition or first impression? Yeah, there's a place for it, but it needs to be spiritually discerned, not just your first impression. That can be totally an opinion again. 
uh, I like uh, the way Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. You brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak what is good? That's cutting through the good words with an evil heart. If you discern that the heart doesn't match the words, except I was told not to do that <laughs> with my Sunday school teacher. Uh, <laughs> Dennis, uh, you might be right, but uh, wisdom, would, there's a better way of saying it. I'm not going to correct Jesus. He can say it any way he wants to. Mark takes it even further. It's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. From within, out of the heart, men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit. All of that stuff comes from the, out, from the inside. All these evil things come from within, and that's what defiles a man. All right? Now, I'm going to give you a list. You won't be able to take notes on this. You have to watch it on YouTube and then write down the list. What hindrances? I'm going to give you... Uh, uh, I did this once for a, a friend of mine who says, I need to know on discernment, I got to do a thing on what interferes. And I said, I could do that. And I just, boop, 19 came out just like that. Okay, first, there's no accuracy without the Word of God. Because if you want to develop in discernment, you get into the Word of God and you let it discern you. Don't worry about discerning somebody else. Start with you. All right? I just love it. There was a, they can discern everybody else, but are you letting God discern you? And there's no true discernment without the Word. The Word discerns. It separates joint from marrow. The Word of God is quick and powerful, separating soul from spirit. It separates. It makes distinctions. It differentiates. This is good. This is bad. All right? So the first hindrance, then, is there's no accuracy without the basis of the Word of God. It's got to match the Word of God. Don't, don't discern something that's not scriptural. And what you have, and this is really what I want to see, the challenge for Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministry, you use what you have. Milk is for those who have not developed daily discernment. Daily discernment. Because you drink the milk and you grow thereby. Strong meat belongs to them who are of full age who by reason of use. That's why I'm saying this is the discernment challenge. The discernment challenge for Kingdom Life Church needs to be that you're going to move from milk to meat and that's going to take reason of use. And you've got Tuesdays are available in this church from uh, 7 to 8 to exercise and practice. You can practice at home, you can practice there, you can practice wherever you want, but without practice, without what I like is one of the things you're supposed to discern is discern prophecies. Well, when you discern prophecies, there needs to be a, a consensus. Let one prophesy and let the others discern. Judge, assess from a spiritual point of view. Use what you have. Milk is for those who have not developed daily discernment. Direction comes from the spirit, not the soul or the body. Spiritual strength is proportional to your level of submission. You need fellowship, feeding, exercise. Spiritual relationships should be developed. Uh, the weakness I saw in the early years was there were people that were challenged by discernment by having real intimate relationship with Jesus is what the challenge was. But what they did was to comfort themselves rather than develop, they would, they would rest on the fact that I'm not as bad as Jones. I'm not as bad as Harry. I'm not as bad as Sally. Rather than move ahead, it was like I'm better than. And they would rest in that. That's not, that's not by reason of use. That's just making yourself feel better. People, marriage counseling was like this. For 25 years before I even moved to Charlotte, I saw marriage counseling like this. Why are you here? How, how's the marriage to the man? 
Good, good, good. The wife. <laughs> There's something, something's a lack of communication here somewhere. But the man had a tendency, men, I'm picking on the men now, they have a tendency to say, I'm pretty good the way I am. That's their own, <laughs> but that's their own opinion. Ask your wife if that is so. Do I, husbands, ask your wives, do I have any blind spots? Yeah. Why do they call them blind spots? It's because you don't know it. You might be sincerely in bliss. <laughs> with faulty information. <laughs> Ladies, you still think you're going to change that man? Only God changes. You don't, you, that's not your job to change him. No. But you need fellowship. You need to be around people that challenge you spiritually, not be around people that you're better than. I mean, I, I had friends that would rather stay in kindergarten for 10 years and be an expert <laughs> than go on to first grade. Huh? Is that the sign of spiritual pride? Stay in kindergarten, don't graduate, and know all the answers and be the bright one in the family. The trouble is, it's not, it's not cute after you've done it for a few years. <laughs> You start to look a little out of place. <laughs> right. God wants to build a habitation, a place where he can stay. And he does that individually and corporately. If uh, you're better than everybody else, maybe you ought to just go start your own ministry then, <laughs> if that's the case. And I had a guy who used to tell me, well, Dennis, the problem with you is you're, you're humble. He thought that was a problem spiritually. He said, you're humble. You need to be a general like me. <laughs> and I devastated him. I said, where's your army? And then we realized he didn't have one. He was just going to have a television ministry. And he couldn't, he, he couldn't even differentiate Moses from Abraham most of the time. But he had a television ministry that he paid with his own money. So he didn't have to have an army. All he needed was to create a platform for himself. So, well, he never talked to me after that, though. When I asked him, where, I asked him where's your army? God wants to build a habitation, but he wants you to be around. He wants you to be challenged spiritually, seriously. And God wants to, to create that diligence and that hunger that will get you into a deeper purpose. You're all created with a purpose, and there's stuff that's hindering those purposes. And here's the one that, that um, was kind of an acid test for me in the pastorate watching people. Most supernatural, this you write down, I'm going to go slow. Most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. The soul. So you really need to be still and wean that flesh's noise till you get into spiritual touch, spirit to spirit. Spiritual feelings will require your natural feelings to be under subjection to the Lordship of Jesus. Your thoughts, your emotions, your choices. Most supernatural is too quiet for the flesh. So what does that tell you? You want supernatural in your life? Most people would rather have hype and adrenaline and call it spiritual. Because it has a better outward appearance. I had a lady in one of the churches we attended to. Was a, she was supposed to be the head intercessor in the church. And she was, yeah, she was screaming and yelling, and, and uh, she's gyrating until she passed out on the floor. And she was totally in the flesh most of the time. When she passed out, it was from exhaustion. 
<laughs> Exhaustion. And you know what she called it spiritually? A breakthrough. That is not a breakthrough. You finally got to rest your flesh. It's all about your flesh. It's not a breakthrough. You don't know the difference between a breakthrough? We were just talking about this earlier, about bearing a burden. There's burdens that come from God, and then there's burdens that you incubated because you identified something that's probably in you too that you struggle with. And so, you know, they say, pray until you get a breakthrough. But what would you do if the burden was not God in the first place and it was something you imposed? You're going to be one frustrated person waiting for that breakthrough because the only thing that left is exhaustion. Now, most supernatural is too quiet for the soul. You'll never forget that. But the soul, the mind, will, and the emotions, what do they want? Hype. Excitement. Excitement. Lusts, if you want to. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Excitement, adrenaline, stress, and oh yeah, suspicion. False discernment is nothing more than a paranoid, suspicious spirit. Paranoia and suspicion is not discernment. Okay. Some of those hindrances. Now I'm just going to read these off. You will not be able to follow me because I want to move on. Hindrances to discernment. Low fellowship with the Father. Low word level. Letting the word discern you. Showing you God's standard. Incomplete repentance. Sorry, but not repentant. Pride. Unforgiveness destroys discernment. It's the killer. Prejudice. Prejudice imitates a bad witness. Here's the funny thing is, I once had, was praying for somebody, and there was a pastor, uh, I think he was Baptist or evangelical of some sort. He was sitting in the front row, and he was watching me, and I prayed for them, and they went down. I knew they were going down before they went down. I would feel a release, and they went, shoo. And I felt, at the same time, I felt him go, mm. So I go, oh, I, I, this is interesting. I knew that was going to happen before it happened. I bear witness to it. He bears witness to it. He would have said, I don't witness that. Correct? Isn't that Christianity? That Christian talk? I don't witness that. No, that wasn't a bad witness. That was a prejudice. What you should have done is said, God, wisdom searches out a matter. God, he didn't consult God. He just, he didn't do that. He's never done that. He hasn't seen that before. He judged it. Wisdom searches out the matter and says, God, if that's you, show me. Many of people got filled with the Holy Spirit because they were evangelicals who didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but when they saw it, they said, God, if that's you, show me. That is the healthy approach. That is the love approach. That is, wisdom is from the Spirit to inform the head. But you've got to humble yourself and say, God, show me. One of the worst things you can do it's called something, and I've, I've been called it, I know a lot of people have been called in charismatic circles particularly, witchcraft. You call the Holy Spirit witchcraft, you need to realize you're, you're under your own penalty. You just penalized yourself. Why don't you say, God, is that you? Or if that's not you, for heaven's sakes, how about let the love of God go to intercede and say, Lord, get them back on track. Let the love of God flow. That's discernment. Discernment has a redemptive solution. It's love-based. The name-calling is outrageous. I, got, I had a letter once on my desk in my first pastorate, and I didn't even see who it was from. I picked up the letter, and it felt really bad. An unopened letter, didn't read who it was from, opened it up, and actually... <laughs> It was someone who said, any pastor who's not joining us and, and uh, shackling themselves to the something or other at the abortion clinic is not a Christian. Wow. So I guess that made, I wasn't a Christian. But isn't that interesting? It wasn't my opinion of the letter. It was what I could feel on the letter. Those judgments carry a spirit with them. Mm -hmm. 
The accuser of the brethren loves that kind of stuff. And it was in the, under the guise of something I'm very pro-life. But to sit there and say, because I didn't participate in this one particular episode, that I was evil. <laughs> it was also the same person that I asked them, where was your army? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> but uh, prejudice imitates a bad witness, but lust counterfeits a good witness. Oh, I think that man over there, he's for me. I witnessed that. No, you don't. You're, you're lusting. <laughs> you want, your flesh wants it. So it can be, go either way. It can be the false bad witness and it can be the false good witness. you got to get neutral and get into God. But uh, and usually when you're accusing somebody of doing something you've got that in you. If you start seeing it in everyone it's in you. It's in you. Soulish or faulty value system? Well, I don't trust anybody's discernment who says, there are many roads to God. For heaven's sakes, we've got a pope that said that. Can you imagine that? All, all religions lead to God. That's funny, but my Bible says, <laughs> I am, I am, I am, I am. Your Savior, your Deliverer, and there's none besides me. I don't know. I kind of take that as the truth. That's my foundation. I am, I am. And he was pretty adamant about it. I am, I am. Soulish or faulty value system. I wouldn't trust any, his discernment. Once, once you've already violated scriptural mandate, I, wouldn't, I couldn't trust just about anything the man said after that. Boom. Repetitive sin will destroy your discernment. Actually, even the lack of use will destroy your discernment. You, you, you just don't rely on it very much. By reason of use, have your senses exercised. Well, if you don't use it, you lose it. Then you're back living it purely by the intellect. I like Thomas Howell. Intellect minus judgment equals foolishness. <laughs> Your head is the wrong organ. You were created by God to be a spiritual being, a thinking, feeling, choosing being. But the... Uh, All right, I'm going to probably close with this. I was going to give you it all in one day, but I think we're going to have to wait too much. But I'll give you my conclusion. How's that? Six pages later. Yeah, I'll do part two, but I want to do, I want to do this conclusion because this is good. This is, we're going to have a heart checkup. That's really what discernment is all about. That's the bottom line. Check your heart. We need to carefully judge our own hearts and make sure we know what or who is ruling at the time of any decision. We are called to assess things all day long. Everybody is. To judge. But when you judge, judge righteous judgment. It's the peace of God ruling. Not the false. The ones to look out for for this week until we get to part two. The part to look out for is the, I feel led because I want to, and I don't witness that because I don't want to. <laughs> That's not the proper source. <laughs> it's not whether you want to or don't want to. That's flesh. Flesh wants to sometimes, flesh doesn't want to. Don't call that discernment. All right. Cease striving, put God back in control. Let's get more conscious of God than evil spirits. That's another telltale sign. I don't trust anybody's discernment that 
they talk more about voices and demons than they do God. There's something out of whack there. And uh, the peace of God is not ruling most of the time. But what is the definition again? Let your love abound and more and more in real knowledge in all discernment. And may his sheep hear his voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.